Is everyone ready? Nice. So my name is Caitlin and I will be continuing on our Nurturing Relationships series, this being the third and final week. Uh, the first week we heard from Karen, Tina, Linda and Dylan on their first-hand experiences of supporting people and the relationships they maintain in their communities. Uh, we then heard from Lynette last week on friendship and loneliness and the six ingredients of friendship being affection, constancy, transparency, honesty, empathy, and trust. And I will be referencing a little bit of what Lynette talked about last week. So if you're not familiar, I would encourage you to maybe have a listen afterward. And if you're wondering, how do I do that? Well, there is a weekly newsletter that is sent to your emails if you subscribe. So check out your inboxes. Um, but now I am here to talk to you about how to be the best friend that you can be. So are you a Rachel, a Ross? Oh, yes, there's the music. Thank you, Mum. <laughs> oh, so are you a Rachel, a Ross, a Monica, a Chandler, Joey, or a Phoebe? If you're not familiar with what I'm referencing right now, this is a 90s sitcom uh, that was quite popular around the lives of these six people and their friendship. Um, and obviously, this is not what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, but honestly, this is how I used to envision how the ideal friendship group would work. A group of flawed people in similar stages of life, bonded by their proximity to one another, overcoming the hardships and awkwardness of life through some lighthearted humor and antics. Uh, however, as I have lived, uh, I had to realize that, that this actually might not be a very realistic picture, surprisingly enough. Um, and as someone who knows Jesus, I had to question, is there more that I could be aiming for? So as someone, so as someone who is Christian, how do we be the best friends that we can be? And to me, that starts with, and it comes back to our greatest role model and the greatest friend that we could ever have, which is Jesus. So do you see Jesus as your friend? This is a little of what Jesus had to say about friendship. If you want to open your Bibles, we'll be going from John 15, uh, verse 9. So if someone wants to yell out the page number, but also be up on the screen. Eight, six, eight. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled by my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. So this is coming from Jesus talking to his disciples, telling them they are not his slaves, but he has chosen them as his friends. He raises them up, willingly not withholding from them, but confiding in them as people who he has chosen, as people who he trusts. Jesus is our friend. He tells them that his love is born out of the Father's love of him and that they too can remain in his love if they do just as Jesus did and obey what he commands of them. And as they obey him, they will be his friends and can be complete in his joy. 
there's an interesting relationship of the friend and slaves in this passage. The slave must obey his master, no questions asked, and does not need to know the meaning of what is commanded of them, nor the consequences. They do as they are told. But a friend knows why they have been commanded and the hope it brings for the future. The hope that he will bring them salvation, that they will be reconciled with God. And what has he commanded they do? That they love each other in honour of God. No more than Jesus was willing to do and did do himself. And as followers of Jesus, this applies to us too. That Jesus has chosen us to be his friends and, for, and shows us the way forward. And going back to the ingredients of friendship. Oh, weird transition. <laughs> it shows that he has affection for us. He knows us fully, yet he finds still finds love and joy in us. He is our constant and he never changes. He has chosen to be transparent with us in his love and has made known to us the mystery of his grace. He is always honest. He has empathy with us. He chose to become human too and feels for what we go through. And he has empathy with us. Oh, yes. And he is fully and always trustworthy. And I think it's amazing that he calls us his friends. He lowered himself to our level and experienced the trials and temptation that we do. He knows us as human. He's not just our king, our savior, our father, someone above. He is those things, but he tells us he is also beside us, standing with us for a lifetime. And what it means to me, that's what it means to me, that Jesus is our friend. And because of the love that he has, we can see in this message that he is preparing to lay down his life for it. Because of his transparency, we know that Jesus did lay his life down for us um, to save us so that we may have life too. And what a challenge that is for Jesus now to urge us to have that same kind of love for our friends. For that kind of love is a commitment. And so in obeying Jesus, by loving each other, we are using him as a template, inviting him into our relationships with others in order to have godly relationships that produce lasting fruit, like joy, peace, love, and hope. Jesus lays out the greatest ideal. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And we hear uh, stories of people living um, yeah, their lives around the world in countries where it's not okay to be Christian um, and see them dying for their faith. Or stories in the news of people laying down life, their life for their friends, um, which is amazing and moving and so sacrificial. But if we look at our own lives, we're probably not faced with that kind of situation every day. So what does it look like to have that kind of love in our everyday lives? Uh, to me, it means sacrifice. To make decisions for one thing means you have to be making a decision against another. So showing hospitality to someone means maybe not having the night to yourself. Being welcoming to someone, maybe it means not winning a argument or a disagreement. Forgiving someone who wronged you. Maybe it means sacrificing some pride. Telling someone the truth and, sac and sacrificing them, not looking favorably to you um, anymore because you told them what they didn't want to hear. Maybe it's apologizing when you've done wrong and taking the actions to reconcile that relationship. And I don't say this as someone who has it all together. I think this preparing for this message actually has been a challenge for me uh, because I know I don't get it right a lot. Uh, even preparing for this message, I have randomly been able to reconnect with some old friends um, who honestly I truthfully neglected to keep in contact with. Um, and it's been so amazing to reconnect with them, but I realized that I've actually missed out on a lot of big 
things from their life, both good and bad. Um, I easily get distracted in my life with my things that I have to do and easily forget to check up on people, to be invitational and to be hospitable, to be active and not wait for people to follow up, but to act first and make sacrifices in my life to prioritize my friends. Because friendship is active. If we look at Jesus, he actively pursued us. He chose us first. He sacrificed first. If we think about the friends in our own lives who we have appreciated, and we talked about um, just before in our conversations, our best friend stories, um, it might be the ones who asked us how we were doing when they didn't need to. The ones that took us out for food just because they could. The ones who prayed for us the ones who committed to meeting up with us. And sometimes we need to actively open up to someone else uh, to let them in because no one is psychic and no one knows what you're going through or what you need if you don't tell them. Do we have that kind of love for others in our church? Previously, I've had some hard experiences at church at a time in my life I was at a church and everyone knew who I was, the sister of so-and-so or Caitlin who was on the worship team. Um, and I had a couple of close friends in church uh, who I would gravitate to, but when they didn't come to church, while in theory I knew quite a lot of different people, I had no idea who to approach or sit with because I wasn't in their group. It was quite lonely and it made me feel quite other because it felt like people weren't curious enough uh, to find out how I was doing or to get to know me on a personal level. And I was and am very privileged to have uh, my family strong in their faith, which gave me a strong base for my own. But I imagine if someone without friendship in the church, um, people to know and care for them, if they didn't have that, it would be really hard to keep going. And a lot of people who I knew did step away from the church over time. And it's such a shame because church should be there um, where we find friendship. Our commonality being we are all there to learn more about God. And I know at church at 126, we are all uh, very welcoming and warm. At least that has been my experience here. But let's not, go, uh, let's not get weary on doing a good thing. Uh, we are human and we're going to get things wrong. But imagine what it would look like if we all had that love for each other, that sacrificial love. What an amazing community that would be for people to be welcomed into and experience the love of God. Forgiving each other when things go wrong, because as humans, they will go wrong. Putting Jesus and each other first when we disagree, because yes, there will be times when we disagree. And to do that, we must remain in the love of God and remain close to him because we can't do it in our own strength. I have loved you even as Father has loved me. Remain in my love, says Jesus. We can't be these types of people without God at our center because God loved first, we can love. We must remain in him as our source of hope, our source of truth, and our source of strength. And I'll end on a story of friendship that has um, blessed me a lot and one that I rely on um, to invite Jesus into different areas of my life. And that relationship is the friend I have with uh, Bethany, who I met in university, and she now lives in Wellington. Um, and she entered my life in a time where I really needed someone to be there for me. And so something that characterized our friendship is one of commitment to prayer for one another, to make sure we knew how each of us were doing and praying for whatever was needed. Because I know whether I reach out first or not, at some point I'm gonna get a message on my phone um, asking how I'm doing um, from her. And because I know she loves God and is aspiring to be like Jesus, I know I can come to her uh, with anything and she is going to do the right by, thing by me. Not because she's a good person, um, and cares for me, but the, more so because above all, she loves Jesus and is going to point me to him every time as I will try my best to do for her. 
we push each other on and point each other toward our hope in Christ. And that is the best thing that we can do for each other as friends. Cool. So finishing up, we have uh, just, oh, I have a little challenge. So at your tables and twos or threes, uh, maybe have a chat of what you guys can be praying for each other. It can be as in-depth or not in-depth as you like, but please be honest. And then next week, it would be great if you could follow up with each other on the things you prayed for. So I'll leave you to do that now. <laughs>